had the, uh, the honor of seeing my daughter married uh, this last uh, Saturday, not yesterday, but the week before. And it really, uh, so many emotions come up when, when that happens, of course. Uh, most importantly, she was happy, so we were happy, right, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, every, every season comes with transitions, and every season comes, comes with new beginnings and, and new ways of thinking and new ways of, of processing. And, you know, really, uh, I, I remember when, when my kids started being born, and just, the, you know, they're in the crib and, you know, we're, we're, we're not sleeping, we're just kind of pushing through life. And I, I remember we went through about a sickness at one point in, in our life. And, and I remember just praying to God, God, let me just, uh, let me live until we get our kids graduated. Right? It was like this, this cry, I want to be, I want to live life on purpose. I want to live as a, as a spouse, as a, as a husband, and as a father. And I want, I want to live for you, Jesus Christ. You know, I, I want to live this life with meaning and value and significance, and I, I want to live on purpose, you know, and just let me live until my kids graduate, and, and uh, praise God, he answered that prayer. So if I drop dead in the pulpit today, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but we, we all want to live lives of significance. We all want to live lives uh, that are worth something. We all want to live life on purpose. And, and boy, uh, I, you, you, look at, you look at history, you look at our nation, you look at worldwide, how many people really, however, you know, think that way in, in historical terms? I, 250, 300 years ago, how many people were, were just pining away like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, I'm, I'm, I, what am I going to do? With, what, how am I going to live significant life? Because really most of world history... Uh, we're the anomaly, we're, we're, the, we're, we're the strange ones, we're the odd ones that are asking that question in, in many ways because most of the people who've ever lived, they've lived a hand-to-mouth existence, right? They're, they're living day-to-day, -day. am I going to eat today? How am I going to live today? Uh, I'm going to farm today, I'm going to ranch today, I'm going to do the things I need to do to survive, right? And, and life expectancy was so much shorter, right? Uh, uh, most people through world history, through, through times, didn't have that upward mobility that we think about here. How am I going to make my life better? Maybe a new job, maybe a new degree, maybe a new spout. You know, no, don't go there. You know, <laughs> right? The way people think, you know, it's like, how do I make my life better? Just crazy, right? Worldly things. Uh, but most people haven't lived that way uh, or thought that. But man, modern life, we moderns. So many things have come into play where we are constantly thinking about how to better ourselves or how to get to that next level or, or how to be successful. And, and we're, we're driven by this, this, this strange thing of, man, value and meaning and purpose. Uh, but it, 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 no matter what stage of life you're in, it, it happens. Like our kids, right, growing up in, in society, growing up in, in culture today, right, from a young age, what are you going to do with your life? What are, you, what are you going to do with your life, right? The teenagers, that the, the pressure they face sometimes, and, and we're well-meaning as parents, like, what are you going to do with your life? You're not living with me, <laughs> right? And we put pressure on them, and, and the, the, the junior high, the high school, God bless the teachers and the administrators, and, but our culture says, you need to find a vocation. You need to find a reason for living. And, and the strange thing, you're like, you know, hundreds of years ago, you didn't have 72 options, you know, you didn't, have, you didn't have 152 options. You, you know, you probably did what your parents were going to do. You grew up in a Mason's family. Well, guess what? You're probably going to do that. You grew up, you know, in a, a shopkeeper's family. You're probably going to do that. And so it was so much easier back in the day to know what your purpose was. You didn't think about it because you really didn't have so many options. Even today, there's hundreds of millions of people that don't have options. They don't have the upward mobility. They don't have the opportunity to change and grow and become something new. They're just... Hey, I was born in this family, into this village, and I'm going to do what my villagers have always done. You know, it's, 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 but, but kids, you know, I mean, I think it's so overwhelming these days. Like, what should I do? I don't know, because technology has shown us you could do that. Internet has shown us you can do that, you can do that, you can do that. And there's a part of it that's like, yeah, I could do that. But another part, like, man, if I do that, I can't do that. And it's stressful. Like, if I cho choose this path... I can't do those 73 other paths. And am I going to miss out? You see how that creates angst and just frustration in people's lives. They, they, they don't know how to pull the trigger, and so they say, well, I guess I'm just going to go play my video games instead. 
uh, then, then you, you know, you get in the job, you get in the job world, right? And, and man, you worked so hard for this vocation, you became certified, you graduated, you, you jumped through all the hoops, and then you get in the job and you're like, okay, now I'm living. And then you look around at your job and you're like, is this it? Is this why I'm $30,000 in debt? Is this why I'm $72,000 in debt? Did I go through all this for this? You see the people I work with. There's got to be more, more to life, right? So, man, so much of life is pushing, pushing, pushing to get to a certain level. And when you, when you get on that, 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 you know, that saddle or that mountaintop, you're like, oh, oh. And, and what, what's really transpired the last several years, of course, is that pandemic put a great pause on people's agendas, put a great pause on their, their trajectories, put a great pause on where they were going, and they, they had to step back and say, uh, well, I've been going to school, but do I really want to do that anymore? I, I've got this job, and it's paying the bills, and you know, I'm getting some applause for what I'm doing, but you know, so many people are like, really, do I want to go back to that office? Do I want to really go do that anymore? And people, so many people have checked out, and, no, oh, I want to find a, a purpose for living. I want to find a reason for living, right? And, and so they're, they're looking, and they're searching, and you know, outside of God, they're having a hard time finding their purpose. Outside of the God-given purpose, they're having a hard time finding their purpose. Because can a job carry a life? Can a vocation carry the weight of significance and worth, especially when it's toxic office politics? Of working for a corporation? Wow, sign me up. Right? A lot of people are saying no. And so you go through transitions, and everyone, everyone sooner or later asks that purpose and that meaning. Like Elizabeth and I, like, man, we, we're, we, all, our, our, all our babies are married, and they're starting to have babies, and like, we've, we've fulfilled our purpose. Or when I was in my 20s, like, that's my purpose, and now, now that my purpose is done, now what? You know? I, I'm squirrely right now. If you show me, if I drive up in a new Corvette one of these days, you'll know why. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing with my life anymore. In one sense, because we did it. You know, we, we did what we set out to do. We're still married. <laughs> Praise God. Right? Uh, so, so now we're looking for a purpose to me. And, you, man, you, there's never a time you arrive in this life in terms, like, one day I'm going to find my purpose, and one day I'm going to get there. Because you retire. Right? Some of you are already retired. Some of you have been retired for 20 years. And you're like, well, I, uh, what do I do now? Uh, what, what, what's my goal now? What's my aim now? I, God's got me here for a purpose, doesn't he? God, God, he's got me here for a reason, doesn't he? He does. He does. Never, never, you never arrive. You never, uh, we, we had a great example. You know, think about your ideal life, right? Think about the, the, the way you move forward in life and, man, I wish I had a purpose. I wish I had a life of significance and worth. And maybe we had an example the last couple of weeks is Queen Elizabeth died, right? And I, I, you know, I don't consume a lot of media, but some of the media I saw really focused on Queen Elizabeth the last few weeks and uh, ad nauseum. Uh, but nevertheless, she, uh, I, I, I went back and I, I saw one of, the, one of the shows said, you know, she really lived a life on purpose. She, it was kind of thrust upon her. Providence kind of brought things together so she could, many of us don't have that opportunity that she had, you know, to, to be at, at a very young age put in a position where she knew her purpose. So back in 1947, she made a vow, a public vow, and I watched the video of it, and just to condense it down, she said, I declare before you, uh, she was, you know, on live television, or, you know, I think it was recording, I don't know if television was really how, how far that went, but I declare before you now, with my whole life, whether it's long or short, I shall be devoted to your service and to our great imperial family to which we all belong. And wow, isn't that like a, like a dream life? Like she knew what she was supposed to do, 21 years old. She knew what she was supposed to do. She knew what her life entailed. Whether long or short, I exist to serve you, the commonwealth, the the England, uh, you know, just all, all the different uh, nations that represented there. And we would all like to be there. We'd li all like to say, yeah, I know my calling. I know my purpose. <laughs> Wouldn't we? Don't we? 
What were you made for? What was your purpose? What, 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 and, and do you have to invent that by yourself? What pressure, what stress, what, what anxiety-riddled thoughts that I have to create my own life, purpose. Uh, the good news of the gospel is that God has given us purpose. This is God's world, and He has made us for His ends, for His purposes. And so we find our purpose and our meaning not looking sideways at others, not looking at the queen, not looking at him or her. We look up to find our purpose. Please open your Bibles to the beginning of the book, Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1, let's review the basics. Uh, hopefully you have this verse memorized, but uh, if not... Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, you know, before there was anything else, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, one of the lies of modern living is that uh, this, this cosmos, that we, the, the earth is a very, you know, grain of sand on a mighty, mighty sea, is here by accident, that, that it's here just by chance, and that all these planets and all these stars and all these galaxies just suddenly uh, somehow came uh, about by themselves. No, we live in a purpose-driven world. God created the heavens and the earth. He made it. And so really from the beginning of the book, we're told that there is a boundaries in which we live. There is a purpose for which we live, and it fa it's found in God. And uh, it's Old Testament, New Testament. If you look at John chapter 1, really reiterating much of what uh, Genesis says in a, in a different way with the coming of the Christ. But John chapter 1, verse 1, and this again, many of you have this memorized, and it's, it's helpful for us theologically and, and for thinking about life to go back to it again and again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Uh, Jesus Christ is the agent of salvation, the sphere in which it was made. The Father made the world. Jesus was the agent, the, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Somehow in, in the mystery of, of that unity, that three-in-oneness, we know that God made it all, but J Jesus is exalted here as the Word, the communication, the speech of God. He is the Word that made all things. So, so we, we, one of the, the falsehoods, of course, is that this world was created, wasn't created. It was here by accident, by chance, by randomness. The second thing is, uh, you know, thinking about these creation uh, testimonies, this Word about who made it, was uh, in this world today... There really is an underlying uh, preaching going on or theme that you're here by chance. You're here by accident. You're here uh, just by some cosmic collision of atoms, eventually that evolved into you. And it's not true. You were made on purpose. God made you. We don't have to be like the existentialists who uh, really, they, the existentialists, really a big movement in the 60s and 70s, they, they, they knew that there was this, this world out there in their minds that was purposeless, that had no value, no meaning, but they determined that if they're going to go on with life, they had to invent their own reality. They had to invent their own purpose and meaning. Bravely, bravely into the night, saying, I, I exist for this, or I exist for that. And basically, the existentialist said that you had to lie to yourself to come up with some meaning so that you could go on living, so that you'd have purpose in your life, even though in the back of your mind you knew, because this is an evolved world, an accidental world, you have no ultimate purpose. You don't answer to anybody. There's no accountability. Nobody cares if you live or die. So that's a lie, because God made the heavens. And God made the earth. 
and God made you. So we start there with our meaning. We start there with our, our purpose, and we can uh, go forward and, and move outward in it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's get a little bit more specific. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, please. <clears throat> Yet for us, he's been talking about idols and man-made gods and beliefs and other, uh, you know, polytheistic uh, understandings of the world. Yet for us as Christians, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So we have here, the, again, uh, the source. The origin is the Father. God is the source. Jesus is the agent. Jesus is the sustainer. But notice what the universe is for. Notice what the cosmos is for. Notice what every creature in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, is for. For God. Why do you exist? God decreed that you would exist. Why are you here? Why are we here? For God. And you start asking, well, what, for God, like, why, how could He use me? Why, why would He want to use me? What purpose do I have? Uh, you know, I struggle with this job. I struggle with that job. I struggle with relationships. My, my kids are struggling right now. What's my purpose? What's my meaning? What's my calling in life? Uh, I, if I have to figure it out myself, it's awful tough sometimes. You exist for God. You know, like the telos, the end of of things, the goal of things is God. All things created by Him and through Him and for Him. We find our meaning and our purpose in that reason for Him creating us. Um, It's not accidental that you're here. It's not by chance that you're here. It's not, uh, you know, some dream some vague uh, reality that we we look through the fog at. It's God has you here on purpose. He made you. And uh, Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. In verse 15, he, he talked about Jesus being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn and the ruler of all things. Uh, in verse 16, Uh, The Apostle Paul says, for by Him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, we think he's talking about the angelic realms, the unseen powers, the unseen forces of our world. we, we don't have a real clue other than what the Bible reveals about creation. We, we see all kinds of inanimate things in the world, asteroids and, and planets and stars, but all the animate things, all the living things, we are just perhaps are told very little in the Bible about what is. But whatever is that we don't understand, God made it. Whether it's dominions or rulers or authorities, whatever, God made it. All things... and. Notice the point, all things were created through Him and for Him. Uh, All things. Why am I here? You were created for Him. Why are you here? Why why are you going to Adams State University right now? Why are you at Trinidad State College right now? For Him. Why are you married right now? For Him. Why are you doing the job you're doing? For Him. Why are you retired right now? For Him. All things end up to the honor and the praise and the glory of God. This is His world, His his universe, His creation, and you're part of it. Don't ever think that you don't matter. Don't ever think that you don't count in the big world, the big universe, because God has created you on purpose for Him. Uh, This uh, this understanding, we start running down this path, we start asking questions. Okay, so... I'm created for Him. Uh, what should I do with my life? I'm 17 years old, and uh, 
my parents are putting a lot of pressure on me to pick a major in college. Uh, I, uh, my peers are putting a lot of pressure on me to do what they want to do and live the way that they want to live. You know, I'm 42 years old, and uh, um, my, 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 my peers are putting a lot of pressure on me, the things I should buy, the things I should invest in, the retirement plans I should put together. How should I live? I mean, you're 78 years old, and you're, you're wondering, man, God's got me here, but how should I live? Uh, should I go collect seashells on the seashore? So, so shall I go just, uh, you know, the hedonistic pleasure-seeking route, or does God have a purpose for me? How shall we live if we're here to, for Him, uh, we have to ask a lot of questions. And so we, we come across this idea of for Him, well, what does it mean? What does it look like? And, and we, we, we have to go deeper, don't we? We have to look a little, a little deeper at what it means. So turn back to the Old Testament again, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Uh, and boy, the second half of Isaiah, what a, great, uh, what a great part of the Bible uh, about God's sovereignty, about his, his, his splendor, about His plans, His purposes. In Isaiah 43, verse 7, uh, one of the many, many places where it talks about purpose and meaning and value, everyone who is called by my name, he's talking about Israel in the context. Israel has been, uh, in, in Judah, are, uh, they, they've sinned against God, they rebelled against God, God has uh, held them accountable, they broke the covenant, God sent them in keeping with His covenant promises. Back in Deuteronomy, He sent them away, He's, he's going to send Judah away. But he's, he's saying, my covenant with you is solid, secure. So he's saying, everyone who is called by my name, Israel, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And so we, we get a little bit closer here. Uh, why were you made? Why was I made? Was it to make money? What Was it to accumulate more and more stuff? Was it to uh, just live a hedonistic, self-centered existence where I, I seek out more and more pleasure and I pers pursue more and more of what I want to do in life? It, it's not. Meaning and value and purpose starts with God. Uh, we're here because of Him and we exist because of Him and we exist for Him. And He says here in many other places that we, you and I, exist for His glory. Uh, it, it's it's a, a concept that maybe in our just do you world, in, in our it's all about you society, have it your way society, uh, make the most of your life way of living, it's quite a contrast to realize that it's not about us, that the universe doesn't revolve around us, it revolves around God. And so we have to come to grips with the idea that we were made on purpose. We were made for another's glory. We were made for another being's ends, the things that he wants to have happen, the things that he wants to have happen in his universe for his pleasure, for his honor, for his glory. And when we're living that kind of life, it's called worship. Uh, this, this, uh, this idea of glory, what, what does it mean, uh, I'm glorious? Right? God says that so many times in, in the scriptures, or, or seek my glory, or, or you know, the angels uh, in Revelation praying, all glory and honor and power to you, God. What does it mean to be, what's glory and what does glorious mean? Well, I could go, like I, I, I was able to run on the, uh, you know, the, the, the beach Outside of Pacific City, Oregon, for the wedding, I, I went on a long run, and it was, again, it was a great, it's always fun to run at, you know, sea level. <laughs> Instead of running here, you know, you feel pretty good. <sighs> but I could look out the sea, and I could, see, I could say, honestly, that's glorious. And so when we talk about something being glorious or it having glory, we're talking about its attributes, its characteristics. Okay, the Pacific Ocean is glorious, man, and its power and its sound and, and the, the, the volume, the mass of the ocean, all the creatures that are living within the ocean. Wow, incredible. It's, it's glorious. And so when we 
transfer that to God and we say He's glorious, what we're talking about, the word glory is kind of a, a summary term of all the attributes of God. He's glorious and he, He's in the sense that He's infinite. He's, he's infinite in love. He's inf- infinite in holiness. Right? He has no ends. He's omniscient, omnipotent. All, you know, everything you could come up with to think about God, that biblically, that, that, that's revealed to us, His attributes, He's glorious. And so our purpose in so many ways we think about life, um, and again, we, we, we get bogged down in paying for mortgages, don't we? We get bogged down in, in paying off our student debt. We get bogged down, if, if only I had that job, I'd be happy. If I could get that job, if I could that, get, that, get that guy to marry me, I'd be happy. Right? We, get, we get, you know, this short-term, short focus right here. We've been created for something more grand and we're called to glorify God. We're called to, to magnify God. Uh, and and what, what does it mean to glorify God? We, we've seen, I shared this at staff meeting uh, last week, just uh, I was reading some books and, you know, that, that James Webb telescope that went up. Uh, really, when we look at the sky, even, even in dark sky arenas like the sand dunes or different places like that, we can only see a, just the smallest specks of light. We see a lot of them, maybe the, maybe the Milky Way, we see, you know, for our naked eye, we can see things, but what we, what we see is just a very a small pinprick of light. But the, pel- the telescope, right, it, it allows us to see something where we, we get, are able to see its glory. Like, the, like the, the galaxies that we see now, we know that they're much bigger than that pinprick of light we can see, so the telescope brings it up so we can see it, and now we can say, ah, oh, even though it's, you know, so far away, it's, it's glorious. And so to glorify God is, is to magnify God before others. To magnify God in His life, to, to live in such a way that other people see Him as glorious. See Him as He is, because the world doesn't know how God is, or what He's like, or His characteristics, or His attributes. So many people, even in our, in our community here, are ignorant of God. And, and so we've been called... To glorify God, to manifest His glory, to bring it forth. And, and the wild thing about it is, you were made for this. Don't you know back in Genesis why you were created or how you were created? Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verse 27. How did God create us for His glory? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So male and female, we are all creations of God. In the image of God, in the likeness of God. And, and you, don't, you don't have to go very deep there. You know, like in ancient times, uh, and even today in certain, uh, maybe some, uh, some states, some authoritative states, uh, rulers make statues of themselves, and they place these statues at different places around their, their, their realm or their nation, and it's a reflection of who the ruler is, a likeness. And so the radical part of God, the maker of the universe, I mean, and it's, and it's, it's all, from our vantage point, it looks infinite, right? We, we're told that there's some boundaries out there somewhere, you know, the edge of the universe. But of all the created things, you and I were made to reflect God. And I don't, I don't understand that, but you and I were made to mirror God. You and I were made on purpose where you and I have this, this uh, calling. Uh, if the world wants to know what God's like, uh, look at Ron. Look at Debbie. Look at Jay. Look at Jackie. Stunning, astounding kind of, kind of thinking here. That we were made to reflect God in His glory, in His honor. And, and of course, that the, the narrative, the, the historical account of the Bible is sin entered the picture and, and our glory, our little glories were marred and, and fallen. And we did not display God as we were made to display God. And yet, when we come to Jesus Christ, when we're born again, when the Spirit quickens us and we're regenerated and God lives in us again, suddenly we beca- can become those people 
by the grace of God, by the power of God, by the authority of God, we can become these people that actually show what Jesus is like again in the world. We need the Spirit to fill us for that. We need His uh, leading in that. We need His empowerment in that. But it's, it's an incredible thing to live in the image and likeness of God in the world. And, and what, is that, what does that mean? And we, let's, get, let's look at it. Glorify, glorify God. I'm supposed to glorify God. I'm supposed to live for His honor. How, how do I do that? Well, in Jesus Christ, in the Spirit... Right? As God is conforming me to the image of Christ, right? that, that's, the tell us that's the end of your life, that, that, that's the big picture, is God is changing you from age to age to glory. Right? Uh, Romans 8, 20, 29, you're, you're being conformed in the image of Christ, and wow, my creation start, my, the way humans were made was the image reflected, and now in Christ, I'm being made into the image of Jesus, to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, so I can in this world show people what he's like, his attributes, his characteristics, his love. And the fruit of the Spirit, right, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Like as God takes over and we're living in his presence and we're being changed, we suddenly become the, uh, the telescope. People... Look at us, and, and we can bring forth God so they can see what He's like. And it's an incredible calling, and it's an incredible thing. And we do this with our attitude. We do this with our thinking. We do this with our works. We do this with our deeds. We do this in, in going to school life, uh, little kids raising up life, parenting life, marriage life, going to work life. It's a comprehensive kind of a deal. We call it worship. And we call it worship. Uh, and and there, there's, we could spend the rest of the day here, and I'm not going to keep you the rest of the day, but uh, there, there's so many scriptures to look at along these lines. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. We, there, there's, Paul is really good at having a bunch of summary statements. That's why so many preachers never leave the epistles uh, Paul's epistles because he's, he's so preachable and uh, he brings things to a, the, to a nice, tight, neat uh, conclusion sometimes. And so he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink, in the, in the context he's talking about uh, idolatry and, and eating food that's been devoted to idols and is that okay? It's, she says, whatever, whatever, whatever you do, eating or drinking, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We call this worship. Um, so, so many places. The, the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 6, 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, again, summarizing, <laughs> in word or deed, uh, your, your testimony, your actions, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Or down in verse 23, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Aren't we often men pleasers? Aren't we often people pleasers? We live for their applause. We live for, yeah, look at the degree I got. So aren't you, shouldn't you applaud me? Look, look at my, my, my new cabin. Isn't it glorious? And, and Paul would say, well, it's okay to have those things. It's okay to do those things, but you don't exist for your cabin. You don't exist for that new truck. You don't exist for that degree. You exist for the glory of God, and we call it worship. Whatever you do, do for Him, for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you were made for. That's what you are crafted for. That's what you're here for. That's why you draw breath still. Maybe you did retire 20 years ago and you're thinking, what am I doing with my life? God allows you to have breath today to glorify Him. And whatever providence provides for a venue. That might be um, traveling to see family members. That might be volunteering in the community. That might be uh, loving your neighbors. We call it worship. The glory of God is our passionate pursuit and it's our highest end it's our greatest pleasure oh you christians living for god ha 
Man, you should see all the things I'm living for. You should see the parties I'm going through. You, 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 you should see the things I just bought. You should see my bank account. You Christians living for God. <laughs> uh, um, can you tell me about God a little bit? Because my bank account isn't very satisfying after a while, and my cabin takes a lot of maintenance. It drives me crazy. And uh, really, uh, I'm tired of the seeking for applause and approval by people. I really want to live a life for meaning and significance and worth. And so we, we have this, uh, this, this radical calling in our life to glorify God. You know what? Uh, worship is something we do um, regardless if you're a Christian or not. You look at Buddhism and you look at Hinduism, you look at Taoism, you look at um, uh, Islam, you look at uh, some of the native religions in our region and, and the things going on, everybody worships, ascribing value to something that they think is worthy, but uh, ultimately there's only one who is worthy of worship, and that's why Jesus came to um, go to the cross for us, to reveal God to us. Uh, first, first Peter chapter 3, verse 18 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. For what purpose? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Uh, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the most important event that ever occurred in the world, he came to do what? Uh, to bring us to God. He, he came to bring us back to God, to reconcile us to God, to redeem us from slavery to sin, to redeem us from fallen ways of living, from man-made religion, from evil ways of, of living, from our slavery to death, to Satan, to redeem us, to rescue us, to save us, to bring us to God. For that's what we were made for, for God. And so He, uh, he saw us in our, in our humble, broken estate, our rebellion against God, our hatred of God, and, and our, 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 our condemnation. And, and Jesus Christ came, and He was incarnate, and He lived a perfect life, a, a sinless life, and He went to the cross, and he, he died in that cross as an atoning sacrifice, as a propitiatory sacrifice, not only covering our sins, but turning away the wrath of God. And all who trust in Him, His sacrifice, His substitutionary atonement, he died in your place. He took the wrath of God for you. He died for your sins. And if you trust in Him, you become the righteousness of God. God says forgiven because Jesus' death, His blood was shed on your behalf and paid in full now through Jesus Christ. And, and so, but why, why did Jesus do that? He saved us for what? For God, not for ourselves, for God. That's the telos, that's the end of the universe, that's the goal of everything. You know, at, uh, the, the wild thing about Jesus, right, in Colossians 1.15, it says he's the image of God. And boy, that, that rings some alarms, some bells, some Wow. We're made in the image of God, but Jesus was the ultimate image, the ultimate revealer of God. Uh, and really, in John 17, if you look at Jesus' final prayer, you know, the, the prayer for the church, He says to the Father, I've glorified you. Now glorify me through this church, through these people. Jesus came when He took on flesh to image God. He took on our mission. He took on our calling. He lived it perfectly. And then... He lived this life of glorifying God, of honoring God, of praising God, of seeking God's praise among people. And now we who have been called into the family of God by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and now by the power of Spirit, we take on that role of glorifying God, of, of bringing God's glory to the world and announcing and proclaiming and calling people to worship Him. And we call that worship too. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. 
Whoever speaks, and this is talking about spiritual gifts, and we're talking about ministry today in our ministry fair. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why, why, why do we serve? Why do we practice hospitality? Why do we uh, love our neighbor? In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Uh, our, our theology says, our study of God says that Everything is from God, through God. He's the source. He's the sustainer. He's the agent to God. Okay, it's for God. It's our theology, but the way we respond to that is doxology. The way we respond to that is praise. The way we respond to that is worship. That's what we're called to. You are made to worship. You are made for God's glory. You are made to shine for Him. Worship, right, is a response. It's a response that only Christians can really respond in the, in the real way because we've met Jesus Christ. We've seen what He's done for us. We, we understand God's glory. We understand His attributes, His characteristics, His power, His might. And so worship is this response. He's saved me. He's given me new life. I can, I can serve Him now. So worship is this response to who God is and what He's done with my attitude, with my thinking, with my hands, with my voice, with my deeds, with my love, with my honor to God, with my respect to God, with my awe of God, with my very life, I've been made to worship. And that's uh, something you got to understand. Some people say that Maybe uh, one day I'll find my calling. Maybe one day I'll find my purpose in this life. No, Christian, you already have a purpose. And everything else is secondary. Everything else is a secondary calling. The Queen of England in 1952, she gave a Christmas message as was her habit. Apparently, she only, the only time she wrote her own speeches was during the Christmas season. And she was a firm believer, a solid believer in Jesus Christ. She said, pray for me. Uh, again, summarizing her speech that I may faithfully serve Him and you all the days of my life. You get the what first. You get the calling first. You see, a calling is empty without someone calling you. You've been called to God. You've been called to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You've been called to live for Him. And everything else from there is, well, this season I'm raising kids. For the glory of God. For this next three years, I'm doing this job for the glory of God. For this next three years, I'm taking care of my aging parents for the glory of God. For this next season, I'm raising cattle for the glory of God. For this next season, I, I, I'm loving my neighbor for the glory of God. For this next season, see, everything else flows from the start with God, worship, and everything else is an expression of worship, and therein, as you go to work this week, as you raise your kids this week, as you love your spouse this week, as you love your neighbor this week, as you honor God through a hundred different ways this week, it's all to His glory. It's all a secondary calling under the reign of the King to His glory and honor and praise. We call this life that God has called us to a life of worship. It's what we were made for. Don't you go to work this week thinking it's just about a paycheck. Don't you go to that home, your home this week thinking it's just about going through the motions. Everything can be done unto the glory of God. In fact, that's what you were made for. That's why you're in the place you are right now, to bring glory to God. Would you please stand in the Lord's presence? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for allowing us to gather today by your grace. We gather uh, because you've commanded us to gather, Lord. We uh, choose not to forsake the, the gathering of the saints. Thank you on this Lord's Day and all, all, all it means and all that we understand about it, Lord, that we can gather in your name for your worship. Lord, we realize uh, even coming to this place in this building today, it's not about us, it's about you. So we hope that today you've been worshipped 
Lord, in our offerings and our sacrifices and our prayers and our singing to you in our, our thinking and our and hearing your word, Lord. Um, we pray that you would be magnified. Please help us to grow in these habits of worship, Lord. Over the next uh, three months as we have this sermon series on worship, Lord God, we ask that we could become uh, your worshipers, uh, moral worship and, and congregational worship and spiritual worship and know what false worship is and, and what true worship is. And, and we could live for you, Lord. Help us to become the people that are living on purpose. And may you be glorified, may you be honored and praised through every person in this room, for you are worthy. Now send us out this week, Lord, and please help us ask these questions, Lord. How can I glorify God today in this place? How can I serve people in this place? How can I love in your name so that you'll get the glory here today, Lord? Help us to think about life differently. And may uh, the people around us be changed and transformed. May we be transformed and may you be glorified. That's our prayer today. Send us out now on purpose for this week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.